Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, last week, Shannon did a phenomenal job um, looking at the Lord's Prayer, and um, that video will be up today um, by the end of the day. So if you missed it, um, it'll be up by the end of the day today. So um, it'll be on um, our Facebook page and our YouTube page. So, But this morning, I want to look at the last two verses that were part of Shannon's text last week, and I want to dive into the topic of forgiveness. It is a crucial topic that we need to hear. C.S. Lewis, you've probably heard me quote him from this stage a lot, but he once wrote tongue-in-cheek. He said, we all think that forgiveness is a lovely idea until we actually have to forgive someone. A young man by the name of Simon would agree with C.S. Lewis. Simon's family was rounded up by a Nazi army and sent to death camps, concentration camps. 89 relatives of Simon were murdered in the Holocaust. As far as he knew, his wife was one of them. He himself barely escaped death several times while being funneled through six different killing centers by the Nazis. He ends up at a Lemberg concentration camp, removing boxes of rubbish from a military hospital, when one day a nurse walks in and she's looking for a Jew. Any Jew will do, and Simon was chosen. So she leads this Jew to, to the hospital room of a Nazi soldier. And this Nazi officer made a request that he wanted to talk to a Jew before he died. And the nurse leads Simon there, and the officer orders Simon to sit at his bed. He introduces himself as Carl Sieg, and he said that he was raised a Catholic, and he joined the SS army against the wishes of his family. And he then proceeded to give his final confession to this Jew as if he was his priest. He spared none of the horrifying details where of, of his years of killing people of the Jewish community. He shared about the day that he found a huge house that was housing about 300 Jewish people and how he ordered his men to set the house on fire and how he described the agonizing screams of the women, the children, and the men that were burning alive on the inside. He confessed that he personally shot every man, woman, and child that tried to escape from the house. And when he finished his confession, the room was deathly still. Simon shook and he teared up, hearing with his hatred toward this officer. But the officer wanted absolution. For him, Simon sat in the place of every Jew he had dehumanized or murdered. He whispered, Jew, will you forgive me? Jew, will you forgive me? Simon sat there for several seconds looking down at the officer and then got up and walked away without saying a single word, leaving Carl C. to die in agony without absolution. A few years later, Simon's camp was liberated by the Allied forces. He survived the last year on just about 200 calories a day, and he was reunited with his wife, but the rest of his family and all of his relatives were murdered. And Simon began channeling his hatred to becoming a celebrated Nazi hunter. Until he died at the age of 96, he spent the rest of his life fighting anti-Semitism and keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive. Yet Simon was constantly haunted by the encounter in the hospital room with the SS officer. He constantly tortured himself with questions about whether he was right in refusing to forgive this man. So in 1976, he tried to bury the ghost of the officer, and he wrote a book called The Sunflower. And the subtitle of the book is The Possibilities and the Limits of Forgiveness. And in this book, he asked the questions that haunted him after his refusal to forgive Carl Sieg. And in the book, 53 distinguished people of that time responded to Simon's questions. They included theologians, jurists, human rights activists, the Holocaust survivors, victims of other gen genocides. The book is a fascinating read, but it proves one thing. There is no easy answer to forgiveness. See, the reality is that apart from Christ, there are no ultimate answers to forgiveness. Back in, 1990, back in 1988, John Stott, who was a brilliant theologian and a pastor in, in England, had a debate with Margarita Lasky, probably the best-known secular humanist in England at that time. And during the debate, Lasky actually admitted to John Stott that she said, what I envy most about you Christians 
is your forgiveness. I have no one to forgive me. Forgiveness is the heartbeat of our faith. And there's no one who talked more about the idea of forgiveness than Jesus. And this morning in our text, he draws our attention to this very important topic. See, we often we think that forgiveness is a gift that we give someone else. You wronged me, and here's my gift to you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to hold it against you. That forgiveness is something we offer them for the wrongs that they have done for us. But Jesus puts a completely different spin on forgiveness in our text. And in our text, what he's going to do is he's going to teach us that forgiveness is a gift that we give ourselves. It's something that we give to ourselves. Jesus says in verse 15 of Matthew 6, he says, If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is a gift that keeps on giving back. It's life's most liberating act. And the irony for Simon is that though he got up and he walked away out of the hospital room, he could never walk away from Carl Sieg. Those words haunted him for the rest of his life. Gee, will you forgive me? Louis Meads wrote that to forgive is to set the prisoner free and to only to discover that the prisoner was just you. Forgiveness is the only way that we can walk away from someone who has hurt us. See, otherwise, SS officer Carl Seed will never go away. So this morning as we begin, I want to ask you, who have you not been able to forgive? Who do you hold a grudge against? Maybe it could be your parents and the way that they raised you, and maybe your childhood wasn't the greatest for you. Maybe it's the pain of divorce, but you're still reliving it day in and day out. And every time, maybe it's every time you see a certain person, the old thoughts of being hurt come flooding back. And I don't want to trivialize the Holocaust by comparing our grievances to Simon's or the six million other Jews that have died during World War II. None of us have ever been asked to forgive someone as horrible as this officer. But, you know, there are people in our lives that we need to forgive. These are disturbing questions that only Jesus can answer. There's something so difficult that Jesus can give us the power to do them. Who's your Carl Seed? Jesus wants to help us to forgive that person. Our text this morning teaches us a couple important truths about this idea of forgiveness. The first truth is that forgiveness is not conditional, it's inseparable. Forgiveness is not conditional, it's inseparable. Jesus says some very disturbing things in verses 14 and 15. He says, if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. See, on the surface, this sounds like a very difficult verse for us to understand. It's been the subject of debate for hundreds of years. Is Jesus suggesting tit for tat, if you do this, then I'll do that. If you forgive others, then I'll forgive you. If you don't forgive others, then I'm not going to forgive you. Is that what he's suggesting? Just a few verses earlier, what we looked at last week, Jesus said that we should pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who forgive those, uh, forgive our debtors. See, taking these at face value The logical person would argue that Jesus is saying that God will only forgive us in as much as we forgive those around us. But can I suggest to you to think like that would contradict the rest of Scripture that teaches unconditional grace? See, on the cross, Christ died for all of our sins, our past sins, our present sins, our future sins. Even as his executioners were mocking him, Jesus would cry out on the cross, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He forgave unforgiving people. The Apostle Paul would write it this way in Romans. He would say, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God's forgiveness preceded us becoming forgiving people. God's grace preceded us becoming graceful people. God's mercy preceded us becoming merciful people. Colossians 3 tells us that just as God forgave you, you also should forgive others. Just as God forgave you. Past tense. 
It is already done. You are forgiven. But just as he has forgiven you, you should forgive others. Future tense, something you need to do, but you haven't done yet. See, we forgive because Jesus has already forgiven us. We don't give grace to get grace. We give grace because we've already received abundant grace. See, God's forgiveness is not conditional on our forgiveness. But God's forgiveness is inseparable from our forgiveness. One cannot exist without the other. They're like Siamese twins. You cut one from the other, either one or both will die. Jesus taught us that the greatest commandment ever is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But then he immediately says that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God, loving neighbor, they're inseparable. Listen, unless you experience God's love, you will never know how to love your neighbor. But unless you love your neighbor, you've never really loved God. They go together. See, in Israel, there are two great lakes that are fed by the Jordan River. The first is the Sea of Galilee, where the shores of the Sea of Galilee, they're lush, the waters are full of fish, and the shores are dotted with communities and cities. The Jordan River flows from the Sea of Galilee into another sea called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a polar opposite of the Sea of Galilee. It's lifeless. If you drink of its water, you will die. There are no cities or people living around the Dead Sea. What's the difference between the two seas? What the Sea of Galilee takes from the Jordan River, it pours back out. But what the, Jordan, what, what the Dead Sea takes, it keeps it for himself. There's an entrance, but there isn't an exit. That's why it dies. In the same way, what we take in from God is designed to flow out from our lives. If it doesn't, we're like the Dead Sea. We will spiritually die. This is what Jesus is saying in these two verses. Again, unless you experience God's love, you will never be able to love your neighbor. But unless you love your neighbor, you never have, you've never really loved God. Forgiveness, forgiveness isn't conditional, but it's inseparable. You forgive because you've been forgiven. It flows out of you. Secondly, Jesus teaches us that forgiveness is letting go. What's forgiveness? Jesus used the same word in verses 14 and 15. He says, forgive others their trespasses. The Greek word there for trespass is a combination of two words that literally means to fall along the way, to fall backwards, or to fall short. You have a friend and he promises to keep a secret, but falls short on his promise. You have a husband that makes a covenant to be loving and faithful, but fails on his commitment. The disciples fall by the wayside on the way to the cross. People fail at their job. They fall short of our expectations instead of watching our backs. The people who are supposed to protect us, provide for us, and pour into us, they have abandoned us and left us by the wayside. And that betrayal devastates us. Trespasses are so destructive. As sinners, we all fall short. We all fall down. We all fall by the wayside more times than we want to admit. It's debilitating, it's painful, and it leave, leaves wounds that sometimes last for a lifetime. How do we deal with those who fail us or pull us down? Jesus says twice in our text that we are called to forgive them. The word forgive means to put something away and lay it aside. The best definition is to let go and walk away. Isn't that how Jesus deals with us? The psalmist writes in the 103rd Psalm that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins against us. Psalm 38, he says, you've cast all of my sins behind my back, Isaiah 43 says, God says, I will remember, I will not remember any of your sins. Isaiah 42, I have blotted out all of your transgressions. Micah praises God in chapter 7 of Micah with these words, says, you will cast all of our sins into the deepest sea. 
But it's hard to walk away from our hurt. It's hard to walk away from people that have wounded us. Martin Luther wrote that forgiveness is God's command. See, I think of Simon's refusal to forgive the officer. I'm reminded of another victim of the Holocaust. Her name was Corey Ten Boom. She was a Christian. But her family would protect Jews in their Dutch home. They were caught one day, and they were thrown into concentration camps. Cory Ten Boom lost all of her family and barely survived herself. Years later, after she was released, she met an SS guard who had brutalized her and tortured her and actually murdered her sister. The man held out his hand to her and begged for forgiveness. Everything within Cory Ten Boom wanted to walk away and abandon him. But she realized that she belonged to Jesus, not to her past. So she took the former tormentor's hand and forgave him. See, when you forgive someone, you in no way can change your past. You can no, in no way change what's happened to you. But you make a choice that you can change your future. How do you do that? How do you forgive someone who has deeply wounded you and left scars that are still there years and years later? Let me give you a few ways that I've been able to forgive others and let go of wounds in my own life. Number one, forgiveness is not amnesia, but it's draining out the poison. It's not amnesia. President John F. Kennedy was fond of saying, forgive your enemies, but never forget their names. But forgetting is the heart of forgiveness. Jesus declares, or God declares in Isaiah 43, I will not remember any of your sins. For us to say that I can forgive, but I cannot forgive, for us to say that I can forgive, but not forget, is basically saying, I'm not going to forgive you. See, forgiveness should be like a canceled debt, torn up, burned in two, never to be shown again. But this is where it gets confusing. Is God calling us to some kind of holy amnesia about the things that have happened to us? Absolutely not. See, as long as we have healthy memories, we're going to remember things that have happened to us, especially painful things, even hurts and wounds that have happened in our lives. God remembers our sins. God's word repeatedly records the sins of the people that they've committed. God doesn't have amnesia. There are things that we should never forget. Speaking of the Holocaust, the former president of Israel said, the living have no right to forget what happened to the dead. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. So when God says that he will not remember any of your sins, it has to mean something other than some kind of holy amnesia. What God is saying is that he doesn't hold it against us. When he deals with us, it's as if he's, we've never messed up. He never brings it back up again. God doesn't have amnesia, but he drains the poison out from our sins. For us, draining out the poison means that we no longer obsess over what other people did that caused the wound in our lives. We don't nurse or rehearse the pain. If we think about it, we no longer get resentful. When we see the one who hurts us, we don't bring it back up again, nor will we bring it up with other people. The memory may be there, but the poison is gone. Secondly, it's not wholly amnesia. It's draining out the poison, but secondly, it is putting this into God's hands. It is putting the wounds into God's hands. You remember Jesus is hanging on the cross and his executioners were standing around him. The people were mocking him and Jesus looks down and he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You know, if you pull back, you've got to ask the question, why didn't Jesus forgive him himself? You see, throughout scriptures, Jesus would say, I forgive you or your sins are forgiven. But why in this instance does he hand this forgiveness off to God? Why doesn't he just say, your sins are forgiven, I forgive you. I forgive you for 
driving these nails through my hands and my feet. I forgive you for mocking me instead of worshiping me as your creator and your God. He was God. He didn't need to ask the Father to forgive these people. Well, why does God, Jesus say to the Father, you forgive them? Why does he do that? Could it be that Jesus had more important things to deal with that day than those who were abusing him? He was about to have the sins of the world, my sins and your sins, dumped on him. He was about to endure hell himself. And he was about to die to redeem a world of lost sinners. Listen, all of our history, all of our story, hung on the balance of what Jesus was going to do that day. Maybe Jesus was saying to the Father, you deal with their sins because I'm occupied with something of infinitely greater worth. I've got bigger things to worry about. Can I suggest to you that the same is true for us? God has called us to be part of a redeeming, God has called us to be part of redeeming a lost world. But we waste our time by shooting cannons at mosquitoes. The greatest strategy that the devil will use is to keep us preoccupied with lesser things. We waste untold hours and channel precious energy into fighting with each other, nursing our wounds, obsessing how other people have offended us, rehearsing past pains, and taking up other people's time whining and complaining nonstop until we've worn ourselves out and we've worn other people out. Aren't you glad that Jesus wasn't caught up in what people were doing to him on the cross? Otherwise, he never would have gotten to the infinitely better thing of accomplishing our salvation and making us a part of his family. Guys, church, we are called to be like Jesus. And this morning, I want to encourage you, get over the lesser things. Move on to the important things. You are called to something so much bigger than the people that have wounded you in your past. Get on to things like sharing the gospel with people who are desperately in need of salvation. Get on to things like giving of yourself to growing in Christ. Get on to things like serving others. You're called for something bigger than the people that have hurt you. One person suggested that forgiveness is the economy of the human heart. It saves us the expense of anger. It saves us the cost of hatred, and it saves us the waste of our spirits. It is taking the things that have hurt us, the people that have hurt us, and saying, God, you deal with them. I've got bigger things to do. You have called me for something bigger than to be caught up in these small things. I'm trusting that you are big enough to take care of it. Help me to do the things you've called me to. Number three, it is getting rid of our childish notions about fairness. Getting rid of our childish notions about fairness. See, you and I, well, us and now Jesus and my kids, we are so preoccupied with fairness. When people hurt us, we want to balance the scales. And in an age of narcissism and entitlement, we are quick to say, I didn't deserve to get hurt like that. But notice what Jesus says in Luke as he hung around the cross. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. These people, they're clueless. The truth is the whole world is clueless. Sin has rendered people blind and deaf to God, taken away their hearts of flesh, and instead put a heart of stone in them. They've made them dead to spiritual things. Not only has sin messed up people, but it has twisted everything that people touch. Sin causes religious people to plan and plot the death of Jesus. It causes civilized people to crucify Jesus on a cross. They don't know what they're doing. Listen, life isn't fair. Life wasn't fair to Jesus. He was the most innocent man to ever walk on the face of the planet, and yet he was arrested on trumped-up charges. He was tried in a kangaroo court, and he was crucified between two criminals, even though he was king of kings and lord of lords and perfect. Life wasn't fair. Life isn't fair. People are not fair. You are not fair. Can I suggest to you that even God is not fair? Because if God was really fair, 
if he gave us what we deserved, none of us would be here. None of us would be able to call him father. None of us would be able to say, he's my Lord. He goes beyond fair to give you grace and mercy that you didn't deserve because the son got the punishment that you actually did deserve. The truth is if the world was fair and you got what you really did deserve, you would have been beat up every minute of your life. So when someone hurts you, stay with Jesus, Father. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And then move on to becoming the Christ-like person that God has called you to be. Number four, it's understanding the human condition. It's understanding the human condition. You know, we're shocked when people fall short and disappoint us. We become disillusioned. How can they do that to me? How could he hurt me like this? All that I did for them, how could they treat me like this? The pain of what others do to us is hurtful enough. But the disappointment that we have in them is even worse. Nothing disillusions like the loss of innocence to find out that they weren't the people that, that we thought them to be. What's worse is the anger we feel toward ourselves because we were so stupid to not see it coming. But again, Jesus wasn't surprised. He heard these words again. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He understood the fallen condition of every son and daughter of Adam and Eve. He knew that even religious people were capable of killing their God, that the Romans who prided themselves on justice could crucify an innocent man, that the disciples could betray, deny, and bail out on their Savior. When you understand your own sinful condition, you will have the humility to forgive the sinful condition of others. You won't throw stone at other sinners because you know that you yourself are not without sin. You'll be less, less naive and less idealistic and therefore less prone to disillusionment and disappointment when others let you down. You need to understand that you are with sin. You're fallen. We're all messed up. Number five, it's realizing the redundancy of vengeance. Realizing the redundancy of vengeance. God would say in Romans 8, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. See, when people hurt us, we want to get even. So we punish them. Listen, but if those who hurt us are Christians, God has already punished them by punishing his son when he took their place 2,000 years ago on the cross. On the cross, Jesus was punished in our place for every bad thing we've ever committed to someone else. On the cross, Jesus was punished for every bad thing any Christian brother or sister would ever do to us. For us to try to get even is redundant. It is also an attack at the very heart of the gospel. Think about the theological implications of us trying to get even with people that God has already forgiven. He didn't pay enough. So we're going to finish Jesus' work by hurting the person who hurt us. Revenge, getting even, is a denial of the cross of Jesus. If the person who hurts us is a non-Christian, it is even more sobering. They have to face the wrath of God one day. What God will do to them is far worse than what you can ever do to them. So instead of trying to get even, can I suggest to you that we need to pray like Jesus, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Finally, number six, it is not abandoning our common sense. It's not abandoning our common sense. Let's go back to the words of Jesus from Matthew 6. He says, twice the word forgiveness is used. We saw that the word, the Greek word there means to let go of the thing that wounded us and walk away from it. For Jesus, it meant to put it into the Father's hands and get about the business for which he came into the world for. So this is where I want to deal with the misconception that we have about forgiveness. Some people think that it means going back to the way things were before. Guys, God isn't calling us for stupidity. 
He isn't calling us to abandon common sense or to perform a frontal lobotomy in the name of grace. Listen, I may forgive someone who embezzled money from me, but I'm not going to turn around and give him my ATM card with my pen and say, here, take my money. God's called us to be smart. The fact that I forgive someone doesn't mean that I allow myself to be betrayed another time or abused again or put my children in danger or put them back in a position or authority where they can do damage to other people. The fact that I can forgive a person doesn't necessarily mean that we can have the same friendships as we had before. Yes, I've got to forgive. I've got to move on. But it may not be wise. It may not even be godly to go back to the way things were before. Forgiveness can be given in a moment, but trust takes time to rebuild. Sometimes trust is never restored, and that's okay too. Remember, we're not called to amnesia. We're called to drain the poison. See, it is at this point of forgiveness that we are confronted with the radical nature of the gospel. See, most of us like Jesus as our Savior, but we're terrified of him as our Lord. Yet Jesus is uncompromising in his talk about forgiveness on the Sermon on the Mount. He demands that we become like him, that we forgive those who wound us the same way he forgave those who drove the nails through his hands and through his feet. And let me remind you why he saved us. The Apostle Paul would write in Romans 8, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He has saved us so that we become image bearers of Jesus. We have been saved to become like Jesus. Listen, Jesus wants a lot of brothers and sisters who look and act and talk and walk like him. It's not safe to confront our pain and those who caused it. It's not easy to forgive and move on as if nothing happened. It's not easy to know what to do when SS officer Carl Seed puts you in a difficult spot. Corey Ten Boom had to climb up a cross and die to her past when the SS officer asked her for to forgive him. This was the man who murdered her sister. Who do you have to forgive? What grudge do you have to bury at the foot of the cross? See, it would be easier for you to to stay safe in a warm womb. But Jesus calls us to a new birth that is a radical new lifestyle. See, we wish we could have ecstasy. But can I suggest to you that Jesus gives us something so much better? He gives us transformation. Forgiveness is the gift that you give yourself. See, forgiveness is humanity's deepest need. It is our highest achievement. This morning, may Jesus, may people see Christ in us so that they would want Christ in themselves. This morning, we come to the table. This table speaks day in and day out that we have forgiven people. Not because we did something right to deserve God's forgiveness. Not because we were the best people out there. Not because we somehow figured this God thing out. But while we were yet sinners, when we were wandering and enemies of God, when we had no desire for God, he sent his son to die and to forgive us. We have been forgiven of much. We have been forgiven incredibly. And our call as followers of Jesus is just as you have been forgiven, go now and forgive. So I'm going to invite you this morning to take a moment as the worship team sings for a second. Would you examine your heart? Would you let the Holy Spirit deal with you today? See, I know if you're like me, as I'm talking, the Holy Spirit is bringing people to my mind that I haven't forgiven. 
people that I want nothing to do with, people that I want to keep away. This morning, would you let the Holy Spirit deal with you? Would you ask him for grace and forgive? Like I said, it doesn't mean that you put yourself back in a stupid situation. But it does mean that you let go and you walk away and you do not let that other person control your life. So as the worship team sings this morning, would you let the Holy Spirit work in your heart? Would you let him bring conviction to you in the areas where you need conviction? Maybe this morning you need to come to Christ and say, Father, my life isn't right. I'm living for myself and I'm not living for you and I need to ask you to forgive me. I am living only for me. And so God, this morning I Will you give me grace and strength and forgiveness that I need? Let the Holy Spirit deal with you. And whenever you're ready this morning, I want to invite you to come and grab the elements from the table and then go back to your seats and then we'll come and we'll partake of the table together. But let's just let the Holy Spirit deal with us this morning. Let's worship.